welcome. And if you recognise that famous greeting, then you'll know our guest tonight. David Frost has gone into game shows with his new panel game, Through the Keyhole, and he's planning some new games for the 90s. Also tonight, we visit summer wine country and the town that's cashing in on Nora Batty's stockings. Plus, we go down the nick to discover why TV cop shows make the boys in blue see red. OK, looking back on some of last week's more memorable moments, on Sunday's Live from the Palladium, comedian Brian Connolly lost something vital. <laughs> Beautiful song that I once had the privilege of singing with a great Tom Jones. He was on the radio and I was in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Brian Connolly. On the BBC's Animal Roadshow last week, a man called Jim told us that dogs can be a remarkable cure for certain ailments. I have had friends who have suffered from asthma and uh, I have known they've suffered from asthma and I've given them a smooth-coated chihuahua and their asthma has gone. If I would say to them, yes, try a smooth-coated chihuahua. And uh, the chihuahua, of course, should be taken with plenty of water so it doesn't get stuck in your throat. <laughs> <laughs> a recent report found that BBC staff are unfit, overfed and overweight. But then television stars know a lot about food. I mean, there's Jim Bacon and Michael Fish. Not to mention Vicky Licorice and Jasper Carrot. Heaven knows what would happen if Mark Curry teamed up with Annika Rice. You'd have to Katie <laughs> boil it up, so cook it well and add a dash of Jack Lemon. And be careful not to let Sir Alistair burn it. Now, if you've noticed a certain sameness about game shows, then perhaps it's not surprising. Most of them come from America, so perhaps we ought to be particularly pleased when an original homegrown idea gets on the air. Through the Keyhole is now showing on Friday nights with celebrities trying to guess the identity of a famous person from a description of their home. The presenter is a new recruit to the game show business, David Frost, and the man touring the houses is Lloyd Grossman. Ah, oh, we're in the home of a sportsman, possibly the inventor of roller tennis. Certainly someone who likes keeping fit, and boy does he have to, because get a load of the contents of this drinks trolley. And I think it's someone who really likes inventing exotic cocktails. I'd like to taste a few of these. It's obviously a famous drunk, isn't it? Um, <laughs> someone who drinks heavily the most appalling concoctions, a drunken broadcaster, and it can't be you because you're here. <laughs> He certainly is here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Frost. TVM stint this morning, I should think. No invigorated, really. We had some good jokes this morning and... Uh... John Smith MP, and uh, so it's a nice way to spend a day. You're so, you've done so many things. So first of all, you were the satirist, then you were the uh, global political interviewer, now you're the TVAM man as well, and then you're moving into something rather less cerebral, game shows. I mean, do you need brains to be a game show host? I don't know. Um, you need the opportunity, obviously. These are panel games, obviously. Through the keyhole's a panel game, and it's like with John Smith today or David Owen last week, I'm still doing the politicos as well. The fun of this was it's the first time that I've ever had the chance to devise a panel game with Lloyd Grossman, whose original idea with Kevin Sim it was. And we had to work out how to get the tour of the famous person's house, when you tell the audience, so the audience can help the panel. And then we still have an interview, a mini interview with everybody at the end. So it was really the thrill of doing something for the first time. And who are the sort of people then that you're looking for who are prepared to put themselves up to be ridiculed? Well, uh, leg pull, shall we say. But <laughs> we've got... Uh, uh, we've got a millionaire press baron from Fleet Street coming uh -huh. up. Mm -hmm. And we've got a heavyweight politician, not Cyril Smith, another one. Um, and we've got a cross set, we've got two sporting legends coming up. So people do say yes. Some say no, some say yes. Who are those that say no? Who's turned you down? Well, we protect the innocent here, but uh, people from all walks of life have said yes and have said no. I mean, funnily enough, my first reaction, I think, would be to say no, but then the people who've done it have had such fun with it, maybe I'll change my mind mm, Well, you're, li you're bound to be asked, aren't you? I think so, yes. And do you think you'll let them in? Uh, what bits will you clear up? Which bits will you Well, that's one of the things. One person on one of the programmes, Lloyd, said, this, this desk has obviously never been used. And he said, 
we spent four hours cleaning up that desk, you know, before he came on. And so in that sort of situation. And Lloyd always says, for instance, that when anyone says, always, they're a bit, when they're a bit dubious about a bit of furniture or anything, they always say, uh, that was a gift from my mother. In <laughs> as if it's nothing, it's nothing to do with me. But Lloyd says the other fascination, of course, is to find out how all the estate agent's language comes out in reality. You know, he really did find one house where easy access to transportation turned out to mean that the M1 went through the back of the garden. You know, really did mean that. Or, you know, like close to find sporting facilities means next door to Millwall FC, you know, or something like that. You know. Well, panel games have been in the news of the world this morning. Um, I'm thinking in particular, what's my line? And it is alleged that uh, Geoffrey Archer has been given the answers to the people who are going to come on the show. Can you believe that that sort of thing can happen? Well, I don't think it would ever happen, obviously, in a reward show, as they say, where, because that would be fraud. This, if it's true or not, wouldn't be fraud in What's My Line. It would be just a bit of a disappointment. In our case, we go to enormous lengths. We have the panellists in one hotel. We dot the people, the mystery <laughs> guests, around other hotels so they don't find out at all. Because I think it's nice for the audience. Maybe it's not desperately, but I think it's nice for the audience to know that when like Willie Rushton makes a brilliant ad-lib about Freddie Starr, as he did on uh, Friday night, that it really is a genuine ad-lib. I think that's nice. Obviously, if that's not the case, I think it's disappointing. Well, we're going to be talking to you later about your other careers as well. Do stay with us. David Frost. <laughs> News this week that Granada Television plan to turn their Manchester studios into a tourist attraction with Coronation Street as the centrepiece. But Granada aren't the first to link telly with tourism. Many top TV series are set in beautiful locations and they're changing the tourist map of Britain. The North Yorkshire Dales are now Heriot country. Jersey has become Bergerac Island. And the posh yachting towns of the south coast call themselves Howard's Way country. But the most successful TV tourist boom is in the South Yorkshire Peak District, where back in 1973, the BBC spotted Homefirth as the likely setting for a new series. This is summer wine country, and they do say that on a good day, you can look down the valley and see the bustling town of Homefirth nestling at the foot of the Pennines. Today, unfortunately, is not a good day. But the weather hasn't stopped the tourists turning out in force to record the locations made famous by Nora Batty, the battle axe in wrinkled stockings, and three old men, Compo, Clegg and Seymour. Well, I suppose it wouldn't surprise me to see Compo marching down the high street. <laughs> but it's nice to see where it all happens. I also wanted to see uh, Compo's ferrets and um, obviously the uh, wrinkly stockings. Well, this may be the closest she gets to the real thing, although Compo and Nora both have cafes named after them. Compo inspired the fancy ferret, housed in the basement where he's supposed to live, and above there's the wrinkled stocking tea rooms, right next door to the house used as the location for the Batty household. And after 15 years of filming, the real tenant, Sonia Whitehead, has become great friends with Nora Batty herself, alias actress Cathy Starr. Oh, it's wonderful. It's like my second home, really. I've been coming here for 15 years now. But, I mean, Sonia is so wonderful when we are filming. She has us with teas and coffees downstairs, and uh, it's lovely and warm to sit in. It's We're a part of the there. family now. A lot of people think Sonia is Nora Batty's daughter. Oh, yes, they come knocking on the door, don't they, and oh, say, right. is your mother in? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's something that I've, I've had for so long now, I completely ignore them, really. I thought it was awful the other year, though, when they took your plants. Oh, yeah, well, they had... They took all the plants for souvenirs. Yeah. The mop bucket and mops, can I? I usually have an old one and it usually goes to that house. Well, today they don't have to take anything off the doorstep because Nora Batty, the uncrowned Queen of Yorkshire, is making a personal appearance for her adoring fans. <laughs> and those fans in turn have made Homefirth a prosperous place. This used to be the storeroom for a hardware store, but when the BBC chose the frontage for Sid's Cafe, the owner copied their interior designs, and now it's a very popular haven from the rain. Of course, when a place becomes famous, there are always those willing to cash in at the cheap end of the market. 
but at least some of the locals lend an authentic summer wine atmosphere. On a day like today, walking isn't the best way to get around, so how about a guided bus trip with summer wine tours, the brainchild of Liz Jackson and Kath Field? We get groups from all over the world, actually. Many thousands want to see Norabati's steps, of course. And then we go out to the uh, outside locations, which are very familiar to them, but they probably wouldn't find unless they were guided. If you look out onto your right, we're just coming down to the pub at the bottom now, where you often see the trio going in for a drink and coming out somewhat later and not quite as steady. I think a lot of visitors do come and hope, at least hope that they're going to see uh, the filming. Well, this group got their wish, even if it was the television show, rather than Last of the Summer Wine. Summer Wine Country. Well, David, the, the Americans are past masters at this sort of thing, aren't they? You, you made a film in Graceland once, didn't you, Elvis Presley's? Absolutely, and that was rather a ghoulish sort of shrine, you know, gruesome, not not harmless like that, you know, I mean, although I must, I remember once when I was about 14, we were short of pocket money and Bill Haley and the Comets were touring this country and we got some soapy water and we sold it on the corner of the street as Bill Haley's bath water, so we, we, we did it too. But, but there's, there's no doubt, in fact, that television does have it have its effect on real life. In fact, I was looking in an antique shop once in uh, the Portobello Road and there was a sign on one of the antiques saying, as advertised on Police 5. <laughs> <laughs> David, stay with us because we're going to take a break now. And after the break, Nina Mishkoff gets her teeth into last week's telly and we'll be finding out what the boys on the beat think of TV cops and robbers. See you in a moment. Now it's time to look back at last week on The Box with the critic whose bite is as bad as her bark, Nina Mishkoff. Hello. You'll have to excuse me, but I'm absolutely knackered. I spent last night dialing and redialing to vote for any act on Opportunity Knocked that looked likely to beat that little beast. I'm sorry, that, that charming little girl. The brat in question is nine-year-old Tony Warren, and her voice is quite good. But what worries me is the effect she has on Bob Monkhouse. Over the last few years, Bob's managed to lose some of that slimy false sincerity. But with this girl sitting on his knee, it's all come oozing back. <laughs> what that man needs now is an oil change. <laughs> I was surprised and impressed by Tom Jones on Jimmy Tarbuck's new Palladium series. I'd given him up as middle-aged Las Vegas, but what a voice I'd forgotten. Doesn't he make Tarby look old? <laughs> but that performance was outstripped by Tom's leather-clad appearance as a guest on Channel 4's show, The Last Resort. It was really rocking, and the show is hosted by Jonathan Ross. Well, him and his designer suits. I believe that Jonathan, who's tall, laid back, and inclined to send his guests and himself up, is the most important new star on telly today. It's not just that he's my new hero, and even more fanciful than that bloke who takes his shirt off in the banty ad. I think he's the new David Frost, so you better watch out, David. <laughs> And finally, Nanette Newman, who's in a dreadful new sitcom called Late Expectations. We're expected to believe that not only is she 43, but she's pregnant, oh yeah. If she can play that, then I can play Twiggy. <laughs> there was a ghastly scene in a supermarket where she bought a tin of treacle pudding, which basically sums up the show, stodgy, syrupy, and well past its shelf life. For a moment, I thought she'd pounce on a bottle of washing up liquid. She does those ads where she's always banging on about how her liquid goes further. Well, I'm here to tell you that it does. Last Monday, it reached right across the room from my sofa to the TV screen. Just one squirt. Try it tomorrow and clean up TV. Good night. <laughs> Join us 
a bit late in the programme. First, I'm going to ask you, David, I mean, are you pleased this comparison between you and Jonathan Ross? I'm, I'm very flattered because as long as the comparison and the fact that he's uh, compared to me means a good sign for him and it's not the curse of gnome on his career, <laughs> I'm, uh, I can only be flattered by that. I'm delighted well, and I, I'm delighted by uh, some new ideas on the scene too. Well, Nina's going to come and talk to you and all of us about that later as well. Now, looking to next week and on Wednesday nights, there's the return of Taggart with Mark McManus as Glasgow detective Jim Taggart on the trail of a psychopath. Taggart's a tough guy, but is the programme realistic? We'll come to that. Do any of the television cops measure up to the real thing? Well, we went down to the local Nick to our subgenuine Bobby is about series past and present and the cop shows took a lot of truncheon. I personally get annoyed by these TV programmes which present policemen as all sort of really. big boots and Dennis Waterman impressions. Is there a police cop show that, that makes you want to tear your hair out and go, Ugh. Yes, um, most obvious is Juliet Bravo. So it's Juliet, Juliet Bravo. Bravo, it's got to be. She's too good to be true. I can't tell you how upset I am to hear that. Aye. I think it's too intense. Yeah. There's always a crisis. Sorry. How can one woman deal with absolutely everything that happens in one place? But that inspector solves everything. Um, she really doesn't need anybody else. She's got to be a mega policewoman or be mega police officer. It's just not possible. What about Taggart? What do you think of Taggart? I think basically it's... Like a lot of the other shows, they try to clear everything up in a short period of time, which doesn't happen. A lot of policemen would say, no, it's nowhere near like the police force. And I think in one or two ways, perhaps it is, but we're too frightened to say. In Miami Vice, they go around wearing designer suits and driving flash sports cars and living on yachts with crocodiles. <laughs> I can't really see myself in designer suits. I could see myself in the crocodile, but not the designer suits. <laughs> For instance, the cars they get are supposed to be cars taken from criminals. We get cars from criminals in here, over in the yard there. Mark II Cortinas. And... <laughs> <laughs> Not the same, really. Well, what about Dempsey and Medby? So, what, when you watch that, what do you think? Oh, it's, it's just <laughs> absolute, absolute and complete twaddle. I mean, there's no other word for it. I mean, it really is garbage. When we mentioned Dempsey and Makepeace in the CID room, they love it. Yeah, well, there's half and half, and there's half fancy Dem Dempsey and half fancy Makepeace, I think. <laughs> the street blues is streets ahead of anything else. Let's do it to them before they do it to us. I think it's, it's the way they have so many different things running simultaneously, which is more like the real situation. Would you like to police Hill Street? Yes, most definitely. I'd right. like to meet Balka. I'd like to <laughs> meet Balka. I definitely like that bloke because he's down to earth and, uh, well, he's a bit of an animal, but uh, I, I must admit I like that character. Get out of here, man! It's right on Hey, man! Then don't do this to me! I'm what? He's only small, and he gets stuck in. He's got a really sweet and kind nature and calm. Oh, is that the way you talk to somebody who's concerned about you? No, he... he's clean. Of all of the the uh, British police um, films, if you like. The Bill was my favourite. It not only shows what their life is out on the street, it shows their life in the station as well, sitting over the breakfast table, arguing over a sauce bottle and things like that. I, I wouldn't say it was realistic. I, I, I just... Their attitude to the work uh, and the way they speak to members of the public is absolutely awful. I think a lot of the shows that show uniformed policemen in this country would put me off. Uh, in particular, the wearing of this. Seems that the props departments of the BBC and ITV tend to pick the largest one they can get, stick it on the actor with the smallest head to make him look an idiot. Right crap you are. What, what I liked about that was the way CID and Uniform Branch respected each other's views so much, didn't you? Oh, and you can see Taggart, by the way, on Wednesdays at 9 o'clock. David, you recently went into printers saying that political interviews on television had become too soft, and I wondered whether that was because politicians simply won't put up with the kind of treatment that you were handing out to people like Henry Brooke 20 years ago, or whether the interviewers themselves had lost their bottle. 
Uh, I think it's a bit of both, actually, because it was interesting when an, an old That Was The Week was shown last November on BBC. That a lot of people said about the This Is Your Life, Henry, but my goodness, if Norman Tebbett's fed up with the BBC now, he'd have gone berserk, you know, 20, 24 years ago. But th those were sketches, of course. I think in terms of interviews, politicians are trying more and more to manipulate the medium, uh, and you've got to try and resist that. You know, politicians try and try and suggest what should be discussed on occasions, for instance, and say, uh, I think we should just talk about my enlightened new plan for old age pensioners, don't you, David? I don't think we want to get into all that stuff about my 87 applications for British Telecom shares, do you? I don't think anyone's interested in that, do you? you know? And I, I think you've got to be very careful in resisting that. And you've got this horrible trend now, too, when, when anyone has a controversial programme, they screen it in advance and, and stop it. It's, they should put it on the air and fire the guy if he was wrong. Because okay. so you're going back on the American campaign trail, in fact, aren't you, with a series of interviews with the presidential candidates, whoever they might be. But I wonder, when we look at this 20-year clip, 20-year-old clip, if you saw the man you're talking to as a future president... Is there one historical character that you admire more than any other, you feel more in sympathy with than any other? One historical character? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh... Of course, the one above all is the man whose simple teachings in a three-year span of teaching between the ages of 30 and 33 set down rules which, if we had the courage to follow them, would solve all the problems of the world today. The Prince of Peace, the man of Galilee. How would you like to be remembered? I suppose uh, nothing more than that uh, he tried and did his best. <laughs> I suppose he did all right, really did. There's some time looking there as well. David, uh, you asked Ronald Reagan how he would like to be remembered. How, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, my. I don't know, Kieran. No, um, I, th I remember once uh, some students asked me a similar question to that. Someone shouted out, David, what would you like to be remembered for? And I said, ever. I thought that was ever. <laughs> I don't expect it, but I mean, I once asked uh, Moshe Diane that question. I said, what would you like to be remembered for? What would you like people to say about you after you're dead? And he said, say about me after I'm dead, but that's what I'm dead for, not to care what people say about me. There's, is there a hope in death? Let, let me bring Nina in here, because uh, Nina, you have wallied this man, haven't you? Yes, I have. That was at the it, beginning of... It was the very start of TVAM, and it was just too much when you were standing there in your dressing gown, and you were very sophisticated, going, hello, good morning, and welcome. <laughs> I mean, it made you want to get behind the sofa. Yeah. I'm sorry, but well, it no, did. Well, it turned out to be absolutely right. We were all too dressed up. I mean, sweaters, we're all into sweaters these days and so on. And in fact, you're quite right, at the very beginning, I um, mean, we, luckily, we made the fastest comeback since Lazarus, but eventually, <laughs> but, the, uh, but at the very beginning, I mean, the BBC went on very casual two weeks before us, and we were going desperate to just get on the air at all, and we never realised that we should change our approach. Nina, you've reviewed so many people, and a lot of people have felt the flack from your pen, but now that you've done it yourself, you've sat there, you've had to take cameras, live audience, live television, are you going to be more sympathetic to us? Certainly not. Why not? <laughs> no, because the problems of the presenter are the problems of the presenter. The viewer shouldn't, shouldn't be made to suffer because of that. I mean, I've certainly made myself Wally of the Week and I'll do it again. But uh, no, 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 th those are, those are the, the part and part of the technicalities. All right, what problems have you faced that you'd rather not have? Well, it, it is the technicalities, but it, the, the hardest part is, in fact, going home and watching myself on the video. And after the first one, I, I, I just couldn't cope. I mean, I couldn't do it sober. I know you two found it hard to get through the show sober. But, uh, I, but I, couldn't, I couldn't face myself sober. And, and when I got home, the only way I could do it was to put a coat over my head and look through the buttonhole just to look at bits like that. It's, horrible, it's awful. It. Okay, yes. David, let me ask you very briefly, because we're running short of time. What's the most hurtful thing that's ever been said about you? I can't think of a deliberate one that springs to mind, but there was one a few years ago now, someone was trying to write in a Scottish paper, David Frost is only 29, but looks much older, and there was oh. a misprint, and it came out as David Frost is David. only 92, but looks much older. <laughs> Got to get out. We've run out of time. That's the end of the show, the end of the series. Good night from all of us. Until the next time, just, just you, you watch, watch it. it.